Can you tall again for me? Yep. I'm tall. Okay. I am big. I am large. I am in charge. I am good at my job and I shall conquer today. Self affirmations achieved. Pam is looking at you like, what the fuck, bro? Who's looking at me? Pam. Oh. What's up, dude? <laughs> Uh, there are many moments in Critical Role that I've talked about a lot. One of the moments I've only mentioned very briefly, and while I did kind of cover it, I didn't do a full deep dive on, is one of the single most iconic moments that many people found the live play through being Jester's Bluff. <laughs> you fucking <laughs> that beast! That amazing! Oh my god, what a troll! I can't what? even begin to digest Such the dust of move. deliciousness yeah. on the cup. Well, I've been holding on to oh, I have gotten block. about that fucking item. <laughs> So obviously, in the moment, a legendary moment of Holy this campaign. <laughs> I wanted to use the words Jester's Gambit, but I had already used a video title that said Scanlan's Gambit, so I couldn't like use the word Gambit again, even though it's a really good word. So instead, I chose Bluff. I don't really like that word so much, and if the title is different than what I'm saying now, just know I found a word that worked a lot better, and that's what I'm rolling with. Regardless, this moment is amazing for several different things that I want to dive into. The first time when I talked about it, I talked very briefly about how I thought the moment should have gone and why Laura was being incredible, which Laura was being incredible. But I think there's so much more to the moment that could really be dove into. And I missed one of the most important things, the context surrounding the moment. And that is what we're going to discuss today. But before we get into it, we need to actually take a step back. First of all, spoiler warning. I feel like when you click these videos, that should be honestly just assumed. However, I have so many people in my comments get upset about spoiler warnings even when I have put them in and they still complain that I didn't put them in. I will avoid spoilers. Two minutes later, Redacted dies. Fuck off. 214. I don't want to give too many spoilers. Notice how basic literacy would imply that I would in fact be spoiling things. 221. I encourage you to watch the episodes surrounding this moment first so I don't spoil anything. Less than 10 seconds. Two clear signs I would be spoiling things. I've given instructions how not to get spoiled 224. Audible Quay and bright red spoiler warning flashes on screen. You literally just have to have eyes for this one. Any questions? I will put giant red flashing letters at the bottom of the screen that say spoiler warning and I still got people saying, why didn't you warn us that we were gonna spoil things? I did. And if you think that I did not give a spoiler warning for this one after this whole rant, you're the problem. Anyways, the second thing I wanna get into is that while we are talking primarily about a moment that happened in episode 93, today we're talking about episode 92 of campaign one for the first part. Not was previously a halfling before being turned into a goblin. And while Caleb and his friend Essek, friend, they were roommates, was able to create a spell that was able to turn Not back into a halfling, it didn't work because some sort of curse seemed to still be there. As you progress, you reach out and extend your thoughts towards Not, and Not, you concentrate and focus on the image of who you truly are in the heart of hearts. As you feel the clay begin to cool and turn cold around you, you engage the second element of the spell. The excitement begins to flow through you with the knowledge that you have the ability at your fingertips to do this. After so many times of discussing and contemplating and daydreaming, this is the moment where you are the surgeon at work and you're blocked. And you pull and it should be working when you push again and you're blocked. There's something dark, something in the way, and you don't know what it is, and it's frustrating. You shake your head and tense your eyes, and as you push a third time, it pushes back. All of you watch as the clay suddenly cracks, shatters across the room, sending shards everywhere. You're having to block your eyes. The window kind of blasts open a little bit. The spell itself, the ritual, the containment field of energy suddenly drops, and all you hear between the two of you as the shadow that encases not is this terrible laugh. <laughs> While this was going on, not heard this strange laughter in the background and realized that that curse was caused by a very specific individual that was still out there in the world. An individual which one of the other party members of the Mighty Nine was familiar with. Bo. See, Bo was very, let's say, unhappy with her family situation. And there was a good understanding of why. Her family sucked. 
Her father was a very successful vineyard keeper and a winemaker. Basically, he had created this entire empire around making alcohol. However, he was not a good father. Yep, yeah, you know me, Dad. Wouldn't be here if I didn't want something. Look, I know you. I know you've had our differences, and I've I've not. I've not been the pinnacle of a. A father, in the same way that you've been up in the pinnacle of a daughter. I accept my responsibilities and the things that I've maybe been a bit harsh on. But look what you've become. She feels like a weird justification of your behaviors, but. I'd like to hope that uh, what I became had nothing to fucking do with you, but maybe I'd be lying to myself. And he had put so much pressure on Bo. As Bo explains it, at one point, Asharnai, the individual who had cursed not, had made a deal with her father in order to create his empire at the cost of something important. In fact, I'll just let Marisha and Bo tell you exactly what happened. He said he, he walked on foot. He heard about some woman who could trade and she he asked how he could find his own wealth and she told him that um he would be successful and that he would have a successful winery and then he would marry the woman he loved and that he would birth a young beau to inherit the family business right, and he took that. it so literally that he named me beau oh, oh wow your dad is like super superstitious yeah I, this piece of jade that he gave me, it's like, it's the only thing that I keep on me. It was like the only real gift he ever gave me because he thought it would protect me. I okay. thought it was a coincidence. I didn't think it had any merit to connect our pasts. Thank you, Critical Role, for not uh, copyright striking me like other life plays. It makes it much easier to tell the story. Now, because of this interaction, they decided that they would have to find out more about this individual who cursed not. And so the most likely thing to do was to go talk to Bo's family. The reason I'm mentioning this is it adds important context. The entire interaction with Bo's family is without a doubt miserable. It is harsh. It is unfortunate. Seeing Bo so downtrodden, a usually very intent individual on keeping her independence and her loyalty, finding herself in such a vulnerable situation is honestly heartbreaking to see. Yeah, I was difficult. I had my onus in everything that happened, but I thought dad was supposed to stay by their kid when they're having a fucking hard time. Eyes Mom kind of... already fucking mentioned that life gets difficult and it's hard. So you're right, maybe it's easy to justify the easy way out. Just get rid of the problem. Because so many times in our own lives do we see people who are put down by their family, the people who they should care the most about and have the people who care the most about them just suck. And for both, this is absolutely true. She was kicked out by her family, basically sold to the monastery, and now as she returns, all she could do is just look at her family with this silent why and receive no answer in response. Now, they do find out the information that they need, and they find out they need to hunt down a specific hag named Asharnai in order to help Not. But this entire interaction with Bo's family will be important. So keep that in mind. However, the group then gathers together, they get ready and they go out on their journey to go face down this hag and finally figure out what's going to happen. And what's funny is they actually have a lot of conversation over what they're going to do. Are they going to fight Asharnai? Are they going to talk to her? Are they going to trick her? They're not quite sure. They have a few communes with different gods, specifically Jester's God, the Traveler, in order to figure out what they should do. And well, they don't get the most simple and clean of answers. To break the curse. Do we need to kill her? That is a method. However, you do realize that there's a few different options that they have, specifically two of them that stand out amongst the rest. Kill a Sharnai and break the curse, or make another deal with her. This will be important. So the party moves on. Eventually, they come to a Sharnai's shack. 
and they meet the hag herself. Which, can I just say, Matt's portrayal of a hag is the most haggiest hag I've ever seen, and it is so beautiful. It's so understated and creepy, and I just feel like Matt really needs props for creating the perfect hag adventure here. And it could have gone on further had later events not happened. That being said, everybody gets to face down a Sharnai. And this is where the true emotional crux and heart of this story begins. See, a Sharnai is a hag which deals in very specific deals. She eats misery. She is fueled by it. She is powered by it. The more misery she is attached to, the more powerful her magic becomes and the more she is sated. Or at least it seems that way. In fact, it actually seems that the more misery she has, well, it sates her current hunger and only creates more desire for more misery. That is why she cursed not, because she had to make a deal with these goblins beforehand where they had helped her out and she was returning the deal. However, the deal was to make more misery for not, so it worked for her. And thus, she approaches this party sensing misery, tasting it. And the way that it plays out, the way that she appears, the way that we feel her presence throughout everything is honestly incredible and sets up this amazing villain which can't be out thought. I'm seeking a conversation. Interesting. Oh boy. You all hear this now. While she speaks, it's almost vibrating around you sourcelessly, even within the house. It feels like it's coming from the walls, but you all kind of turn and you can sense the source a bit coming from the house, but you cannot see anything. <sighs> Which of you visited me? from afar these past days. I would like to see the face that held the prying eye. Are you guys actually gonna look at me right now? You're looking at me. Go. <laughs> <laughs> and this is what leads to one of the most interesting moments in a live play, or honestly, TTRPGs in general that I've ever seen. See, a Sharnai is willing to make a deal, willing to make a deal to break Knot's misery as long as she gets more misery. And so we see this event where the party members begin to try and entertain the idea of making deals. The forest up until this point into meeting a Sharnai was dangerous. They had to burn resources. So fighting her may not necessarily be an option. And Matt's portrayal of this character has so clearly emphasized how powerful she is that it doesn't make the players want to directly attack her just yet. It's a final option. And so, we have a moment where each of the party members go in and attempt to make a deal with the hag to try and gain information while also seeing if a deal could be made. And first is Ford. Ford approaches her and has a very leveled conversation. Honestly, this is probably the most telling of all of the conversations. I assume you came with a reason. I did. Forgive me, the words fall a bit short when you're in the room of something as revered and mysterious as yourself. We've. She's done quite a bit of research. Flattery. I like it. Happy to please. Ford is guarded, he's hesitant, but he's fair and he's smart. He talks to her and attempts to gain what information he can from her. But Ford, at this point, has honestly gone through most of his character arc, most of his journey. He knows who he is, he knows where his value lies, and he knows that to continue to inflict misery upon himself is not something that is fair to him. It is not something that someone has to do. And so when the hag eventually makes a deal to Ford to give him more power, to give him more of what he needs in the world, Ford just simply says, no thank you, and he walks away. I can turn that around. paint an alluring picture, but no, I thank you for your time, and I turn, and I leave. I think that is honestly incredible, and even more so if you look at Travis himself. See, Travis actually genuinely has a fear of these moments. You could tell how much it bothers him when Matt plays these super creepy characters, but in this moment, Travis and Ford remain stoic, they do what they need to, and they walk out before they cause themselves a problem. But this then leads to the next individual to enter the hut and talk to a Sharnai, Bo. And this is why I talked about the episode prior. At this point, Bo has been downtrodden by her family. She also understands that the fortune that her family had was not through their own hard work, which she assumed, but instead, the hag. And this is harsh for her, because despite the fact that she did not like her father because he was a terrible dad, 
she had some amount of respect for him because she assumed that this entire idea, this stupid idea that a witch gave him his fortune was false. It was a scam. Her father had worked hard. He had done the work he needed. He pulled himself up by his bootstraps and he made everything he had. He built his entire fucking life around this fortune teller, around a, a fucking tarot deck, basically. But did it work? Is he rich? Is he married to your mom? Yeah. She, yeah, but he. So. she said that he would just, he would be successful and that she told him that he should start, he should buy a plot of land and just try, try farming. And he ended up buying this shitty piece of land that no one wanted because they couldn't grow anything. And he was able to get grapes to grow. And then he turned it into this really successful winery, but he busted his ass doing it. It wasn't that he, he had fortune or the future told, he just... But what about the woman? Like... What did What did she... Did he Why say do you how think... he found her? Like how, who? Did she talk about debts or something? But now she finds out the one thing she actually respected wasn't even true. Her dad didn't actually get this. It was a magical deal made with a witch. And this kind of breaks her. Until this point, she's had this idea that hard work will get her where she needs to. Even with all the misery, if she works hard enough and she tries hard enough, she can get where she needs to go. And now that belief has been broken. And as she enters the shack, we see this broken, downtrodden, defeated version of Bo. I walk in. Is this about new misery? What now? Yeah, okay. <laughs> I can sense we are already tethered in some way. Tell me. Familiar taste. Familiar. So, not new. No. But I can take new. What more could you take from me that you haven't already? have an imagination, don't you? <laughs> Quite a lot. <laughs> mm. What would you give me? And honestly, I don't understand how people say Marisha is a bad role player. When you see this moment, when you see what's going on, I just, I don't understand how you can say that. And Bo talks with the Sharnai and immediately begins to entertain the idea of a new deal. A deal that causes her misery. In her eyes, if hard work isn't going to get her where she needs to go, she has gotten as far as she can. She has friends that love her. She has achieved some amount of fame. She's achieved some amount of accord with the world. And it's only another day before the boot drops. Eventually something's gonna happen. Something is going to go wrong. So she might as well quit while she's ahead. What I want is to be given something that you know you would not want to lose. I'll walk away from all of it. Everything that I've worked really hard to get. This family. My old family. My new brother. My position. I've achieved more than I thought I ever would. <clears throat> Richer than I ever thought I would. More skills than I ever thought I would. I don't know what's left past this anyway. And so she entertains this idea with the Sharnai of her leaving her friends, because why not quit while you're still ahead? At this point, she talks, she decides to consider, and she leaves the shack. The door closes behind Bo. Be ashamed to walk away empty end it. I leave. 
Now, I actually wanted to address something before moving on to the next section. While editing, I noticed something that I missed in my initial pass-through of these episodes, and that was Marisha's reaction at the end of the episode. Now, so as to not give spoilers and ruin the entire tempo of this video, I'm not going to talk specifically about what happens until later. However, I do want to address that at the end of this episode, while everybody is freaking out about what happened, look at Marisha. It's interesting how much this seems to have affected her, and we realize that this was not just a tossed out decision to see what would happen. Marisha had chosen to have Bo leave the campaign, as she basically says so. Bo was about to just walk away from everything. Dark. No, man, my mind. Cupcake. Now, I don't know Marisha, so I can't specifically talk to what was happening here, though I'm sure the car ride home was very interesting for Matt and Marisha. But it's clear here that she was very insistent on this decision. She had decided that this is how it needed to go. She had decided that something bad must happen. And that is fascinating. It fits so well into what I'm going to talk about at the end of this video. So stay tuned, because I love how it all wraps together. Now at this point, somebody else goes into the shack. Not. It's actually funny that Not goes in because approaching the shack, she was actually invisible. She wanted nothing to do with the Sharnai. This is the hag that ruined her life. But now she's finally going to face it. Or at least it initially seems that way, but that's not actually true. When Not goes in, she's not intent on facing a Sharnai. She's intent on finding a way out of this no matter what. See, Not's had a miserable life. She was kicked out of her family, or at least forced out of her family, and while her family would gladly accept her back with loving arms, she doesn't believe she's worthy of that. This new form she has is terrible, horrible, and most importantly, it has accentuated the things she hates about herself. Being told that she was not pretty and not, not brave and not coordinated and not smart and just not. And so because of this, she just wants out. Life has given her enough misery. It's not fair for her to continue to accept more. And so while we see Ford turn down misery, we see Bo accept misery, not chooses to force this misery on other people. Talking with the hag, she begins to try and figure out what she needs to do. She tries to figure out what's going to happen next, and eventually she offers something nobody could have expected. Does the misery have to affect me or, or my friends? Can it be anyone? It can be a misery offered, but it has to be given freely. It's hard to take something like that. The willingness is what makes it so right. I'm not promising anything, but what if two warring nations were about to form a lasting peace and that peace just sort of went away. Sick. Sick. She says, there's a war about to happen. There's a war going on, a war that I am actively involved in negotiating the peace for. Wouldn't it be better if there was misery all over the world that I caused? if I sabotaged these negotiations for peace so that I could finally have my own body back. This is interesting because it is genuine negotiation, but not feels justified. Not has gone through all of the horrible things up until this point. Not has had to suffer. And finally, at some point, when we go through this amount of misery, it is so easy to think, isn't it just somebody else's turn? Why do I have to continue to accept this misery? Why do I have to continue to be in this horrible situation? Shouldn't somebody else have to deal with this? Is it not fair for somebody else to deal with it? That is an amazing and interesting character choice. And I always love Liam's reaction to this moment. Sick. However, Not considers this, talks to the hag, says she'll think it over, and walks out. The door closes on Not. Now what's interesting at this point is there's actually a conversation between everybody before the next person goes in. At this point, people begin to discuss what they've offered to Asharna because people have been keeping this so close to their chest. And eventually Not admits somewhat what she offered as well as Bo. And what's 
so fun to watch as Bo admit how down she is, how much this is the best she has. She offered to give up everything that she loves because at some point it's gonna get taken away. It might as well be her choice. And seeing the reactions of everybody is so telling. I'm good at being a loner. I'm used to it. I'm comfortable there. What does that mean? The things we've done together. I'm never gonna top that. We have to fix you. Cause you have a son. You have a little boy to raise. And all of us. We're eventually gonna find our own way. It's not gonna last. What are you talking about? What are you saying you? you're gonna kill it yourself? Are you saying what are you saying? No, no. She's saying she'll leave all this. You're going to leave us? You all are the greatest family I could ever ask for. Can I can't top this, you know? Then don't offer that. Don't offer that at all. Because at this point, the next two people who go in are so important. We see this happen, and then when Bo admits this, when Bo says she's going to give up everything she loved, Yasha walks in. And the first thing Yasha says is, you want misery? I've got tons. Let's talk. Oh, she's I walk right. in. It's, it, oh. Okay, the door closes behind you. Damn it. You were saying you want misery, and I have it in spades. What are you looking for? You walk with heavy scars already. I don't know if you could offer me a fair trade. It's hard to feed from those who already wallow at the bottom. And what's interesting is that Asharna is not interested in Yasha's misery. Yeah, after all, why would she be? It needs to be misery that she gets to experience, and Yasha has already experienced this misery. She's not connected to it. She doesn't get to feed off of it in real time, and so, why does she care? And while Yasha does try by offering one of the closest things that's important to her, a book of flowers that she wanted to someday give to her dead lover. But I could give you something that would cause me a lot of misery to give you. Yeah. I take out uh, my book from Molly. I have been collecting things for someone to bring to them. These were for my wife. And I pull out a, a flower from Molly. I don't want to give these things away, but I can. A good thought, but not equal. Even Asharna offers something incredible to Yasha, the opportunity to bring her lover back. But Yasha simply knows it's not worth it. She has been through misery. She has experienced misery. And this is not something she wants to go through again. So while she wants so badly for it, she turns around. She walks out and the door closes on Yasha. But here, here is where this entire story changes, where the entire thing goes in such a direction I did not expect when first watching it. Jester walks in and she talks to Asharnai. Hi. <laughs> You're the one that found me. I did, I did. I'm really sorry about it. You know, we just really needed to see, like, who you were going to come to see, and I didn't know that it would bother you. You know, I didn't even think about the fact that it's like, in the future, if you ever want to scry on us, I wouldn't blame you, you know, because I did it to you before. I wish that was anti-misery. Take some, take some. <laughs> She discusses with her and she offers the one thing that would genuinely cause Jester real misery because Jester is not miserable. She's happy. She's content. She offers her her hands, her hands, which she loves 
to paint with, loves to create with, a genuine misery because this is more tasty to Asharna. And you can see it in Matt's face. He knows that this NPC loves this idea because while everybody else is offering misery that already exists, Jester is offering misery that never would have been there. A person who loves to create, who loves to see the beauty in the world, no longer able to do so. She cannot bake, she cannot eat, she cannot paint. Everything she loves is gone. True, genuine misery. And you could see it in Matt's eyes playing this hag. It is there. It is tasty. She wants it. Those are artistic hands. Yeah, I, I paint. I draw. I now also play piano. Life. Do you want me to play something for you? Back to what you said before. Are you offering your artistic expression. Um, you like my, like, ability to draw? It is something I see brings you much joy. Um, it does, it does, it really does. And this is where I think the true emotional crux of the story comes from. Jester, in a moment of acceptance, says this is stupid, but it's for her friend. She pulls out a cupcake and says, this is the last one I'm going to be able to eat by myself. Can I before you take my hands? And the hag says yes. And in an act of kindness, she offers part of the cupcake to the hag. <laughs> That's going to make things so difficult. No hands. <laughs> <laughs> You're the one who offered it. Have we a deal? As she leans forward, seeming to consume the interior of the chamber, looming over and down upon you, the one lengthy hand reaching out like this. Well, hold on. Maybe before we make the deal, I can eat one last cupcake. You know, since I won't be able to do it. I'm going to pull out my last blueberry cupcake. <laughs> Will you split this cupcake with me? Have you ever had the blueberry cupcake? Mm, I don't believe I have. Make a persuasion check. <laughs> Twenty-four. She reaches out and grabs the other half of the cupcake. It's so small in her long oh. curled fingers. Kind of. At which point, Jester says, "That was sprinkled with the dust of deliciousness." And at this point, the entire thing begins to unfurl. All of Jester's plan begins to unfurl. The Dusted Delicious creates disadvantage on wisdom saving throws. And so she's going to have disadvantage on Jester's next move. A modified memory, a modified memory which is going to allow her to change the entire aspect of this conversation. Everything that has happened up until this point now gets to change and she gets a chance to do something else. And I will just let the rest of the moment play out. Okay. Did I succeed? Yep. What? I'm going to make her believe mm -hmm. that she enjoyed my company so very much that she agreed to end Knot's curse because she liked hanging out so much. <laughs> <laughs> and she hasn't had good company in a very long time. Laura? <laughs> Fucking uh, oh, oh. So as you complete your incantation, the minute of describing this shift in time. I get done with the, telling her that and I just start going, <laughs> oh my god, you are so funny. <laughs> it has been Quite a while <laughs> since uh, I've taken just a moment to 
relax, I, know, I suppose. right? Everybody needs that. <laughs> <sighs> you caught me in a good mood. <laughs> <laughs> well. Should you come across any more of those cupcakes? I will send them your way. Do not be afraid to come visit again. I will definitely do that. You know, they make some that um, are called black moss cupcakes. I will, I will let you know because, yeah. <laughs> Should I send my friend not um, in, or, or is it just, uh, does it, do you need to see her? It's fine. And you see the hand kind of wave past, and the shadows of the room grow extremely dark. The lantern fights to maintain a flame, and then it slowly expands back out. This has been fun. <sighs> well, it's a long journey back, I guess. I guess we should head out, huh? Thank you so much. See you later. See you sometime. Okay. <laughs> Is the door, does the door do the thing? Right. <laughs> she seems very distracted and is trying to piece together incongruent events, but waves a hand and the door closes behind. That is incredible. And while it is a great moment, a great D&D moment of a player outsmarting the DM as Matt admits, I don't think that's what makes this moment important. Up until this point, we have seen every character, every player go in and offer misery, except misery. No misery is going to happen, except misery is a foregone conclusion. And then you have one character who simply says, no, why do we have to be miserable? What if something good happened. This is gonna seem like a slight tangent and I apologize, but it does connect into what I'm talking about. There's a moment in Steven Universe, the show that aired on Cartoon Network, primarily created by Rebecca Sugar, that I honestly think encapsulate this moment incredibly. See, there's a character, and spoilers for Steven Universe if you haven't seen it. There's a character named Lapis who has up until her entire point in life, just experienced misery. Everything she experiences is misery. She has abandoned everything that ever cared about her. She has run away on her own, but she can't quite convince herself to leave too far. And so she's just set up on the moon. Don't ask why if you don't know the series, but the point is Steven, the main character, finds her there. And they have a conversation where she expresses how she feels, expresses everything she's been through. She expresses why she can't go back because what if something bad happens? What if people don't forgive her? What if people don't care for her? And Steven says one simple phrase, what if something good happened? That is incredible. While we don't realize it, this is actually something that's very important for those who are racked with anxiety or anxiety disorders. The actual act of encouraging people to realize that something good might happen is so important because it is so easy to get downtrodden, to realize that the world is cruel, the world is bad, things will happen, entropy will naturally happen, things devolve into chaos, and therefore it's not worth caring about anything. The simple act of asking yourself, what if something good happened? so important because good can happen. And in this moment, Jester proves that. While everybody else wanted misery, while everybody else wanted to suffer, Jester said, why do we have to? What if something good happens? What if I just try something and see if I can make this better? She creates a wonderful memory for Asharnai. She saves not by changing the memory of what Asharnai has gone through. She changes the memory so that Asharnai believes she had such a good time with Jester, such a wonderful conversation, that it was worth just dropping the curse for not because it was a nice thing to do. Nobody has to go through more misery. Everybody gets a wonderful memory and they all get to walk away. That is beautiful. Yes, it was a role play moment and a live play. And yes, it was an amazing moment of a player outsmarting a DM. But what's more important to me is it's a beautiful moment of realizing that it's okay to believe something good might happen. It's okay to believe that the world is not always dark. It's okay to believe that not everything is going to go wrong. Sometimes 
something good happens. And that is so wonderful to see. And I, I, I genuinely teared up after my fourth time of watching through this entire episode because that moment hit me. It made me feel hopeful. And hope is a truly wonderful thing. Life gets dark sometimes, guys. Sometimes it gets hard. Things just keep going wrong and you're always waiting for the next boot to drop. But one of the best things you could do is ask yourself, what if it didn't drop this time? What if something good happened? Something bad will always be in the future because that's how it works. But bad is only one side of the coin. If bad exists, so must good. Look for the good moments. Look for the beautiful ones and make those moments. Assume that the good could happen and pursue that. Make it happen. Have faith in yourself because you're amazing. You're incredible and you can do good. And isn't that a truly wonderful feeling? At the end of these videos, I'm supposed to do that thing where I ask you to like, comment, subscribe, stupid YouTube stuff. Instead, I only ask this. If you could go down to the comment section and just write about something good happening. Write about the most recent thing that happened that made you smile. Something amazing that happened. Give people hope that good will happen because it does. It's not worth lingering on misery because misery loves company. But hope invites it. And that's worth having. So go encourage each other, go out into the world, and make it your own. And never forget to play your role, you beautiful bastards.